for what I think really is going to be the last of this semester's uh, joint series of talks between our gracious hosts, the Fundacio Rui Cunha and the University of St. Joseph's History and Heritage Program. I did say um, back sometime in late April when I chaired the last of these talks that this was going to be the last talk of the semester. But I'm very happy to be proved wrong about that because an opportunity came up to have another very enjoyable and stimulating end of semester talk. Um, the Fundacio Kunha happened to have a slot this week. Originally, it was planned as a dual act between Michael Hitchcock and Annabelle Jackson, who have worked together on uh, Malay influences on Macau cuisine, uh, and I believe have published a paper. Is it going to be a book on the subject? And then, unfortunately, Michael's trip to China fell through for reasons that I'm really not quite sure about. Um, and he was not able, um, something went wrong with the host institution in China, I think. Uh, and by that time, we already had the talk set up. And Annabelle very graciously agreed to go ahead and do this solo instead. Now, I suspect that to most of you, Annabelle Jackson needs very little introduction. She's lived in Asia, I think based in Hong Kong, for a great many years. Um, she has written 13 books to date, I believe, including Macau, The Muddy Pearl, which I haven't brought with me tonight. Um, six books on Asian food of various kinds, including these two, the first of them, Taste of Macau, Portuguese cuisine on the China coast, came out quite a few years ago, but is still very well worth reading. And the second came out much more recently, The Making of Macau's Fusion Cuisine, From Family Table to World Stage. Now, the one thing that everybody knows about Macau is that, it, apart from the fact that it is the gambling hub of Asia, is that it is also um, a food place, to put it um, no more strongly, that people come to Macau to enjoy themselves and to eat a special cuisine which is a mixture of Portuguese influences, Chinese influences, but also um, with a lot of input from uh, Portugal's various Asian possessions. There was a great deal of interchange between Portugal's other possessions, Malacca, Goa, um, and also Portugal's uh, African uh, territories for four or five centuries. So Macau really does have a rather unique cuisine. Tonight, however, where um, Annabelle is going to be looking in particular at Malay influences and exchanges between um, Malay cooking and Macau cooking. Um, and to compare this with other 
fusion cuisines in the region as well. Um, so I will now turn the floor over to our speaker. Um, I'm, I know that just looking at the poster has made me feel hungry while we were working on it. Um, and I'm sure that uh, we are going to know a great deal more about the Malay uh, influence on Macau food, and we'll probably all come away uh, feeling that we want to go and sample it as fast as possible. So welcome here tonight. Welcome very much um, indeed to our speaker, particularly for stepping up <laughs> and taking this on as a solo engagement. I believe the Prince of Wales is doing something similar <laughs> at the moment, most of the time. Um, we're very glad that you could do this, and thank you again. So th thank you for that very kind introduction. Um, we're obviously quite an intimate group, but I guess we'll still go, go, go through some, some pictures and some ideas and then end up with, with possibly, hopefully, some discussion. In, in a way, it is a pity that um, Michael Hitchcock isn't here because he actually speaks Malay. He spent a lot of time in Malaysia, and my speciality is really, really food. I'm, I'm an anthropologist, but I am a food anthropologist with a little bit of sociology um, background as well. Um, so Michael could have brought um, a much kind of bigger picture. And Michael's actually my PhD supervisor. And can you imagine that you can do a PhD in Macanese cooking cuisine, which is what I did, and he supervised me. And sort of out of so many discussions with him, indeed, we've recently written a paper together um, which is what this talk today is, is based on. But here is me really just coming very much from my area of expertise, which is um, gastronomy. But I hope that um, um, it, it still is coherent, even though we're only talking about food. However, we are talking quite a bit about language. And, and can we just start right here with a gastronomic approach? We've already talked about Macau and Malacca being Portuguese possessions, as it were, because, of course, was Macau ever actually a, um, a colony? Probably not. So already this is a grey area. Probably Malacca was a, an official colony. What I find interesting if we're talking about a colonial view is that when we start to talk about food, we really upset the power relations. Even a lot of the language, contact languages, which have emerged in colonial societies, even some pigeons, we'll come back to this a little bit in more detail later, are really based on the language of the colonizer. They're based on the, the one who has the power. But when we start to look at food, food is grown and it's cooked. And if we just think for a minute, even just about our little space here, when we probably used to at least grow a little bit of food and fish a bit and keep some chickens, um, the Portuguese would have had no idea about what half the vegetables were or half the foodstuffs were. But local people would know what to do with them. They would know how to cook them. They would know how to preserve them. So while a lot of colonial powers happen in, in trade in the marketplace, food happens in the kitchen. So it can really give us, I think, a, a very different understanding of colonial history. Colonial history is written by colonials. Food history is written by not colonials. It's written by the people who are doing it. And I think that's one of the reasons I find food anthropology so interesting, because it really is very, very grass, grassroots. Kind of inherent in the title here, and this has been so much my research pursuit, is what is Macanese cuisine? I did an interview on Monday with a Portuguese newspaper, and I just did one, a TV one here. It's like, so what is it? Is it a fusion of Portuguese and Chinese, which is very lazily banded about? 
And so I want to just spend a minute thinking about these kinds of special cuisines that have grown out of different global encounters. And I think it is important because I said I think at the base of this is, is a working towards what is Macanese food. And if we start to look at particularly Malay Malacca, I think it, it's very fruitful in, in that search. UNESCO in 2017, when Macau became a creative city of gastronomy, called Macanese cuisine the first fusion cuisine in the world. I really don't like the word fusion. I'm also disputing that it was the first. Fusion suggests that something is fusing to something, which possibly even already suggests some kind of um, this, this is the dominant cuisine, and we're fusing it with something a little bit local. But also the term fusion is so complicated now, having been appropriated by the celebrity chef um, community, starting with Wolfgang Puck in LA in the 18, 1980s, when fusion cuisine was like the new great thing. And then it fell out of fashion. So I think this is not an easy word. We have words like hybrid, which is really great for cars, but it's actually really pejorative because if we look in a, a Oxford English Dictionary, hybrid is, is like um, two breeds coming together and creating something else. It's not a very pretty picture, probably. And then we can use a word like Creole, which, as we know, there really is a, literally a, called a Creole cuisine in um, in, in New Orleans, uh, together with Cajun, and, and they become very, very confused because actually what you have in New Orleans today is Cajun, not Creole, although Creole is the original cooking of New Orleans. And when we look at the meanings of the word Creole, Creole can, can mean you're black or white or mixed or all kinds of things. This is very not helpful either. And I'm not really trying to complicate things. I'm just trying to not give labels to cuisine so that we can understand culture through cuisine so we can understand history and trade and cultural relationships more deeply without having to like stick labels on things. And so I'm, I guess what I'm, and this will come up a little bit later as well, is trying to argue that there is such a thing as a new cultural form that doesn't need some kind of label put on it. And once we label something, we fix it in history, we fix it as a concept um, and, and then get, get very confused and we, and we don't deepen our understanding, it gets fixed somewhere. Anyway, and I guess we'll go to the next slide at this point, um, the movement of food and ideas and people is nothing new. And I want to go back to which, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, but maybe don't really know when it actually started. Colonial history, as written, is very different from a recipe, even if it's not written. But let's go now to the Colombian Exchange. Professor Charles Spence at Oxford, who's, he's one of these really wonderful, brilliant people, um, but he's written a book called Gastrophysics, which anyone could read. Um, and he does all these amazing experiments, like um, if you play jazz in a restaurant, will people pay more or less for food? And if you play classical, will they pay, pay more? And he does, does some beautiful research. And he will argue that there is no such thing as a pure cuisine, that all cuisines are fusion based on this. I guess this was the first major, not, not predominantly human movement, but just movement of foodstuffs across the world. And of course, this is not without its problems, because once you start to move foodstuffs, you upset ecosystems. You don't just move food around, you move disease around. But, the, but this is a very, very interesting starting point for us, isn't it? Because if we try to consider 
Italian cuisine without the tomato, Indian cuisine without chili, uh, and I suppose very pertinent to what we're talking about today, Malaysian cuisine without pineapple, without peanuts. So these are massive transformations that were starting. The Portuguese arrived, just let's take the Portuguese, in 1511. This was happening 20 years earlier, right? This was already, foodstuffs were already moving before we had settlements, colonial settlements and so on. I'm also very keen to take this conversation, even though we're focusing on, on Macanese cuisine, and here we are in Macau, to pre-colonial days. And this, of course, is what we understand as the red one, um, what we might call um, the Silk Route, and the blue one that we might call the spice trade. And of course, we, we are here on the map we are, Macau is an incredibly critical part of this whole system that really centred on, on the Indian Ocean here, but all the land routes. And what I find very interesting, I, I'm not a historian. I, again, I'm, I'm, so much of my research is done by food but brings in history, is that when we start to look at these port cities and the makeup of these port cities, they have so much more in common with each other than they have with the cities in their hinterland. And this is how we can say that Macau looks as if geographically it's part of China. Well, it, it, it indeed is. But all of, all of these links, all of these port cities, all of these people traveling between, OK, whether in caravans or whether on ships, but just even just think about a ship. Who's on the ship? So there must be someone cooking. Um, where are they from? What are they cooking? Who's on the ships? There's missionaries. There's tradespeople. There's people who know how to navigate. There's people who understand these waters. Even just on the ship, you've got multiple communities all connected by these cities where, where we inter intersect the red and the blue lines. And we won't go so much into it now, but when we get really go into the lind food linguistics, and we'll do a little bit later, almost everything comes back to here. So many of our foods by name or sort of by derivation or style go back to Persia. And again, not my area of expertise, but we will know that Persian was, was the original language of, of, of um, the, the intelligentsia, the academics. So that, that pervades back into India as well, pervades this area. That was, that was the language of the, intelligent, the intelligentsia, the academics. If we didn't need reminding, Macau was once known as the Venice of the East. We know now it's known as the Las Vegas of the East. But I think this map really helps to show why that was. It's absolutely on the cusp. And really critical also about, and, and of course we're going to go a bit off the map here, Macau was so important because of the China trade between Japan and China, which we'll mention again in a little bit. So, I really love that, that image. That's actually my own cookbook that I just, I mean, it was just a self-published book and I've used it so much it, it kind of fell apart. But even if you just want to spend one minute looking at that image, you will recognize so much, right, of that language. Some of those dishes you will recognize. This is Goa, right? We're not talking about Goa today, but Goa, Goa fits in somehow to our link. So if, if, if you're Macanese or Portuguese, you will recognize a bunch of stuff there and some of the dishes are, are, are definitely the same. So what I want to just try to do here is when, maybe me, when I started um, my research, kind of feels obvious that, okay, the Portuguese first arrived in Goa, not even thinking about Africa now, just Asia. 
arrived in Goa, so you'd think that any kind of influences, culinary, linguistic... OK, then we go to Malacca, because Malacca was about one year later when the Portuguese settled there. And then you would think, OK, then all those influences end up in Macau. We don't know very much about Timor, but that, that, these links are very, very strong. However, it would be lovely to think that there was such a sequential, chronological order of things. But what we're going to see in a moment is um, that prior to the Goa, Malacca, Macau Portuguese influence, there was always already Malacca influence on Goa pre-colonial. We have evidence that there was quite a lot of culinary and other influences went the other way from Macau back to Goa. And here we have what we're kind of talking about today, the Macau, Malacca, just going both ways over decades, over centuries. So if we just think about Malacca sat on, this, on the Straits of, Straits of Malacca, isn't it called Straits? Um, which is still the busiest shipping route in the world. So before the, the Portuguese arrived, it was already an incredibly thriving community. Have I put that up that um, I haven't, but I think it was like in the when I'm it is said that when you went to the marketplace in Malacca, you could hear 84 languages. This is pre-Portugal arriving, right? We have evidence that the Malays were already in Goa, as mentioned earlier, before the Portuguese. And I think what's very interesting here also, and I, and I think there's a very, very good chance that you're familiar with um, Peranakan cooking, on Nyo Baba. So before the Portuguese arrived, we had a thriving, trading Chinese community from Fukien province. And at this point, so we're, we're talking well, like, well, late 1400s, probably when the Colombian exchange was taking place, before 1511, when the Portuguese arrived in Malacca. And at this point, Chinese women apparently were not allowed to leave China. So these, the Fukien traders who were arriving in Malacca were marrying local women. Now we have to sort of also think in our heads, this is before like Malaysia was a thing and Indonesia was a thing. Um, so it was, it was all, the borders were much more porous and those countries didn't really exist. It was much more based on, on other factors. So the Chinese, we think, were marrying local non-Muslim women, Siam women and so on. And so this whole Peranakan culture it, it evolved. Very, very strong culture, therefore, an intermixed culture. So if anyone's going to argue for the first fusion cuisine, at least in Asia, then it, it's that one. And, and it's thriving. And, and if you've been to Singapore in the last one or two decades, or indeed Malacca, you will see there are many, many, many restaurants. And it's very, very well researched and documented. And I do believe that the former uh, Singapore Prime Minister, Lee Kuan Yew, his wife is Peranakan, very powerful group as well. And then once the Portuguese had arrived in Malacca, um, apropos their colonial, colonial project, which was to marry locally, they're into um, enhanced trade and trading relationships. So the Christang community um, was born. Um, Papio Christang became one of those um, what, what we call contact languages, obviously to, to speak Christian, right? Um, and then after that, a cuisine would emerge, which would be something to do with Portugal, probably something to do with Goa, very certainly something to do with Peranakan as well. And Christang, as we'll see a little bit later, has so much influence on Macanese cuisine. But it's so interesting that often if we say Macanese cuisine doesn't really have anything to do with Chinese cuisine, no, it doesn't in Macau, but yes, it does in Malacca. I think I'll come back to Portuguese Square a little bit later because it's such a... Um, such a curiosity. 
since the Portuguese left Malacca in 1641 to be supplanted by the Dutch and the British, that this is like one of the big tourist attractions. As I said, let, let's come back later when we, when we start to look in more contemporary terms about similarities between Christian and, and Macanese. So I think that this is, is really a, a key point, isn't it, about why we're, we're linking so strongly Malacca and Macau. It's because of the China-Japan trade. So spices from Southeast Asia, um, porcelains and silks from China were going to Japan in exchange for silver. And at this point, China was not allowed officially to deal trade with Japan, so the Portuguese were the middlemen. Apparently the Portuguese were wonderful at navigating pirate-infested waters of the South China Seas. And I think this was really, really, really the glory days for, um, for, for Macau. That's really when it was the Venice of the East. It was, it, was, it was critical because it was right on the way, right? So we'd load stuff in southern China, in Goa, and, and, then, and then we got up to Japan. Second, and this is critical, Portuguese colonial project, marry locally. Guess what? You arrive in Macau, there is no one living here. 3.3 square kilometers. And the few people that are living here, also from Fukien, actually, like in Malacca, they're living on their boats. Arma Temple exists, obviously the um, temple for the goddess of the sea. There is no one to marry. So, so what do you do? So you bring over wives and servants from Goa and from Malacca and from Japan. And I'm sure we have a few slaves in, on the ships by now as well. And as someone has remarked, um, it wouldn't have literally been recipes, would it? But food, food knowledge, food thoughts would have come from Goa, from Malacca, from Nagasaki, etc., and landed here. And this point has also been made very strongly by Jean de Silva that in the 16th century, the, the, these, I, I, don't you love that image of the, ocean, the Indian Ocean being a Portuguese lake? Portuguese were everywhere. In the islands, which are now French, um, in the east coast of Africa, right? And then all the way around. So, so much Portuguese influence, but intermingling, because the Portuguese were very flexible, as we said. They, they married local, no problem, right? They were seafarers, they were discovering, they were open to everything. Louis Camoy, she talks about, oh, nutmegs, oh, coconuts. I mean, just like this incredible excitement and the, 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 yeah, the, the excitement of, of discovering. We perhaps go on to something um, a, a little bit um, more specific. Now, we, I don't know anything really about um, linguistics, and I hardly speak any, any other languages, only a bit except English, so I'm really ill-informed. Ill but we, we know that um, the study of language and linguistics to understand history is, is very developed. And I'm just quoting um, Robert Childerson here a little bit, and perhaps I can literally read his quote. Be, because linguists are interested in, in, in food as a, because of course it's the, the, the lingual frank of the everyday, it's what you do every day. So um, his quote is literally, while the application of linguistic theory to the exploratory study of cuisine may not be suitable in its entirety, it represents the opportunity, and this is important, to reconstruct as precisely as possible the socio-economic and cultural conditions of queerization. L languages, pigeons developed clearly because they had to be some way of communicating with each other. But once you don't need them, they disappear. Somehow, um, food as material culture doesn't disappear because everyone's eating and continuing to eat the same things, even if they're speaking a different pidgin or a different language. Mm -hmm. 
I want to get a little bit more specific here and, and look in detail about some of the ways that we, we study food. And it, let, let's just take a look at specifically the two cuisines that I've mentioned. So this is Nilnia Baba again. I'm, I'm sure you're quite familiar. It's interesting here, isn't it? I said it's been very well researched that um, academics who've been looking at Nilnia Baba, you know, it's, it's not really, it's not, it's not a fusion, it's not a hybrid, it's cultural lo lo localization, cultural interaction. And there's some alteration, but it can be such a mix of things as well. Peranakan culture, it, will, it was broadly Chinese, the men were Chinese. But there were different things that singled you out as Peranakan and not Malay. Critically, one of those was eating pork, of course. Um, there were ways that we dressed certain furnitures and so on. But the food really, really um, set you apart, I suppose. And this, for reasons which we might touch on a little bit later, the Peranakans um, became a very, very important, influential community. So they were there when the Portuguese arrived. Out of Portuguese interaction um, came the, the Christian community, which I suppose broadly we could say would be Portuguese and Malay, but maybe there may have been a little bit intermarrying into the Peranakan, but very little. So I'm not quite sure what the actual kind of ethnic makeup would have been, but let's assume it's, it's Portuguese um, and Malay. Um, this is the only Christian cookbook. I, well, there's, there's maybe one more that I really know of, and, I, and I, met that, I met Melba Nunes in Malacca when I was doing my research. So, so that is Melba there. Isn't that cute, right? Uh, uh, and, um, and this is a quote from her. But look at this, that the influences in Malacca of the Dutch and British actually influenced the cuisine as well. So it really was not a fixed cuisine. It was not a fusion cuisine of the Portuguese and the Malays. It was like this new cultural form that just sort of shifted among different communities. And, and as you know, Malay is officially comprised of Chinese, Indian, and Malay communities. So all of those would have influenced the cooking. But we also know there's other communities like the Chitti, like the, the Indian Malay peoples. So this is an incredibly interesting um, cuisine. And this book is full of Liam Perrin's Worcestershire sauce also. But just look at those pictures, right? I mean, you probably think that they're from a Macanese cookbook, right? But they are from this cookbook. Some of the dishes in Christian cooking are absolutely identical to those that we understand that we have here in Macau, especially. Those are two great examples, right? Because Guinness and, and um, ground pork stuffed in, steamed in. Cabbage leaf. The core difference is just that we're, we're here we are in Malaysia with the rempa, the spices. But it doesn't mean everything's spicy because these two dishes are not spicy. And there's so many other similar things to Macanese food. And we have crossovers with, with Kristang and Peranakan. There's... Um, the so-called Kari Kapitan, which the Peranakans will say it's Peranakan and the Christians will say it's Christian. And there's a Ponte Ayam based on the kind of fermented bean curd sauce. The Christian will say, this is Christian. The Peranakans will say, that's Peranakan. So very similar sometimes to what we have here, that um, Macanese say, that's a Portuguese dish. And the Portuguese say, no, that's a Portuguese dish. They, they just become you know, part of, of the local canon or the Macanese canon. And now just um, a little bit more specifically um, about why this is at all interesting. Well, at least it is to me. Ways that we approach food as food anthropologists when we're doing our research. And there are, there are a number of ways. And one of them, obviously, is, is the critical one today, which Michael isn't here to go further into, is etymology. And in Macanese Patois, we have so many Malay words, or even Christian Patois words, and in the dish names of Macanese dishes, we have so many 
which aren't Portuguese, which you might think is Portuguese, but actually it's not Portuguese. It's maybe one letter's different. It's actually um, from Macanese Patois based on Malay language. But let's start it a little bit simple. Sometimes we, we look at a cuisine, okay, what's unique about that cuisine? Um, and we might think about an ingredient or a condiment, which is really critical to the cuisine. Um, Balichao, which um, I'm sure my anyone Portuguese friends here will say, yeah, Balichao is, is not a Portuguese word, probably based on um, Black Chan, all similar, different Malaysian words for um, fish sauces or, or fish blocks. And we can probably argue um, that the Macanese, that the, sorry, the Chinese in the jar is probably based on Balichao. Now, we don't really see this around anymore, do we? And I'm not even sure that the krill that it originally was made with is available. It's time-consuming. Put all of these ingredients in some kind of a jar, leave it for three months. So probably we're going to buy it now. But that would be a defining moment, a uniqueness um, about Macanese cuisine. But it's not in every dish, and we're not really going to find it. You can't buy it as a souvenir to take home. But anyway, so that's one way perhaps to... Um, look at a cuisine, but maybe not that relevant, we can also take a single dish. And now we've perhaps come to a little core of the talk this afternoon, this evening, the Macanese chili cotti. Um, now you, you can look down the ingredients list and think, uh, okay, so it looks a bit like um, something a bit familiar, like lots of things. Um, beef, pork, onion, garlic, nothing very special, but okay, we're in Macau. Oh, Indian curry powder. Um, bracket, of course, Indian curry powder doesn't really exist. It's actually a British invention because, of course, when we're in India, we do everything from scratch. The British created the curry powder. That's another subject, isn't it? But we've got curry powder, Indian influence and turmeric. So you already think, oh, that's interesting. So what does that tell me about this Macanese dish? A lot of it seems quite European or Portuguese, but it's got these little kind of um, um, interesting little elements that might make me start to think a little bit. And then we can um, look at other similar dishes. And it, it, I'm not sure how fruitful um, this route is, because obviously you can see we've got a samosa here. But as, as um, students of gastronomy in, in India will tell you, the samosa is actually not Indian, right? And I say, oh, I love you when you tell me that, right? OK, that's from Persia, etc., right? And you know you've got like... Um, an English Cornish pasty, you've got a quiche, you've got lots of Asian things, even some kind of dim sum items. It's protein wrapped in something. It's a bit like the um, noodle spaghetti, I mean, which came first, or did they just, you know, they probably just emerged completely independently of each other as a, a really effective way of eating, carrying food, enclosing a small amount of lovely protein in something which is calorific, which is pastry. Um, what I also find quite um, interesting, if we go down this route, however, and this is going to relate to the next slide, but I mention it now, the third image is an uh, English mince pie. And a mince pie, as some of you may know, is something that's eaten in England at Christmas. And it's, when I used to make them when I was a kid, I used to make it with suet. But it's basically just sugar and dried fruit. Um, and now the suet's so unfashionable and bad for you probably too. You don't even have that in English mince pies anymore. But originally, it's called a mince pie because it was made, made with minced meat. But it just changed slowly, slowly, slowly until it became what it is today, which is just something very, very sweet and rich. So sometimes to look at yeah, well, dishes' similarities, something can go from being something savoury to something sweet. And... I love the quote, I know he was a bit trendy probably in the 70s, Jacques Derrida, the French philosopher, linguist, argues that every time a word is used, its meaning changes ever so slightly. So I, I like to think that every time a dish is made, it changes ever so slightly.
Well, this is a lovely quote, isn't it, from um, Udervost is a, a historic linguist. So he's sort of, this is when I started to say, OK, when I'm trying to research Macanese cuisine and understand culinary journeys, culinary conversations, I've got to really em embrace this if I'm interested in cuisines in Asia and indeed how they link with islands in the Indian Ocean and East Africa. So I've just given some really, really small examples here of, of the mix-up of the names of Macanese dishes. So it's not just about Malay, it's multiple influences, isn't it? And I'm, I'm sure the kinds of people who would come here would know that we, it's argued very strongly that Minchi, which is probably what one of the most favourite classic Macanese dishes, is not from Macau, it's from Hong Kong. It's created in the Macanese community in Hong Kong. And we've got all of this, like a tasho is a, is a pot, but what you see in a tasho today, right, has nothing to do, in fact, that's probably the most local dish there is, but it still has a Portuguese name. But the, the incidence of, of Malay terms uh, comes up time and time again. So I'm going back to chili cotti because it's sort of one of my favorite, one, favorite ones in a sense. So here we go with something called chalakuti in Malay, which was a sweet thing. And now chili cotti, as we know in Macau, is a savory thing. But when I was visiting lecture in a university in New Delhi in October for the whole month, um, and I was talking about, um, really from actually more from a go and in Goan perspective, talking about Macanese food in Africa and so on. And I said, OK, so chalakuti um, is a Malay word. And an, it, one of the faculty there said, no, 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 it's not a Malay word. It's a Tamil word. Chalakuti, right? Meaning sweetheart, how lovely. But as, as, as if Michael was here, he would say, yeah. But actually, Tamil language may be older than Malay language. However, the word chalakuti was introduced to Tamil language through Malaysia. And this is how like, extraordinarily complex it gets, and, but indeed, how, how interesting. Um, and I think I'm right in um, saying that, OK, chilicotti is quite like shamusa, same concept, but obviously different sorts of um, constructions. Shamusa sounds a bit like samosa, and right, shamusa is the Portuguese word for samosa, right, Teresa? Yeah. Um, and then we have another, as we know, another Macanese case called chili cotifolia, which is completely different. It's nothing to do with pastry. It's rice, a rice flour wrap in banana leaf. But kind of the whole point is still a wrap, which is the whole point that you enclose protein in some, in some kind of a wrap. It's, it's cooking within an enclosure. So why, I mean, where these names come from, but this is just the sort of um, indications or research that one does to just try and un understand, not just about culinary conversations, right? It's, it, it's history and trade and cultural, the moving of culture, development of culture. And, and perhaps we're going to end here um, on, on a kind of a, a very different note, actually, because I want to talk very quickly about Christian culture and Macanese culture. You've seen this book already. Among the Macanese cookbooks that we have, and indeed there's been some proliferation of them, um, the middle one, of course, I don't, I don't have the actual cover, but if anyone knows Tony de Silva, who's a lighting expert, that's his dear mother, looking very elegant. That's, that is the cover for his Macanese cookbook. And you'll see that the, the last one, is, you know, it's, it's all about family recipes. Christang people, Macanese people, are very, very much representing their cuisine as a family affair, right? It's something for the domestic kitchen. It's us, it's ours, it's our culture. These are very, very similar. And you'll see that these are not just cookbooks, and there are many more. They're full of personal accounts about families, about memories, not just repositories of recipes. Uh, meanwhile, Peranakan cooking, you can have it anywhere in high-end Singapore, easily in Malacca, although it has to be mentioned that many of the restaurants in Malacca are now not using pork in their recipes so as to attract a larger audience 
And I have one particular Chinese friend in KL who says, I will not go to a Chinese restaurant in Malaysia or a Peranakan restaurant that does not cook with pork because it's inauthentic. That's another very sort of interesting subject, I guess. Um, so obviously that's, that's kind of for tourism purposes. The Macanese, as we know, in, at least in colonial times, um, not very sure about what's going to happen post-colonially, had, had a position of power. The power in Malacca was already, always among the Peranakan. The Kristang have been called um, um, the bastards of, of the Portuguese colony. So when we look at Portuguese Square that was created in 1985, in, even the Portuguese left long ago, somehow it's become part of the tourism um, package. But it's also, um, I wonder what that word is. Um, Portug Portuguese Square is right, uh, right on the water. And the Cristang were traditionally fisher people, fishermen and fishmongers, very poor people. So the perhaps bitter irony is the right word. So there's Portuguese Square celebrating the Portuguese in Malacca all those hundreds of years ago. And, and actually the fate of the Cristang was quite poor except for what we understand, the upper 10, I guess that's the upper 10%. So there were some with some power. Um, and what do we have today? Again, just a, such an interesting parallel that the Kristang live in Malaysia where they are not recognized as a people. And the Macanese here in Macau are not recognized as a people. Do you know if, you, if you're Macanese, as I understand, and, and you, you go to part of the censor, there is no category for Macanese. So you're either... Chinese or Portuguese or other. So we have these very, very sort of interesting parallels of these like big tourism pushes for Portuguese culture in Malacca, Portuguese Macanese culture here. Um, and, and I guess I just sort of end with a kind of a dot, dot, dot there because I find it very curious, very fascinating about what's, what's happening in those sort of parallel communities, parallel, um, parallel countries, I suppose we could say. So if that's sort of the gorgeous picture, right? Old Macanese family, I think Rear Central or somewhere. So if, if I can conclude a little bit, I hope what we've started to explore today is ways in which syncretic, I like that word, syncretic communities and, and different kinds of syncretic identities evolve and in what circumstances but how they interact with each other um, in, within, but also outside of colonial perspectives, um, and how they are sort of entering post-colonial society today with the particular sort of pressure of, of tourism. And I think that's where I'll finish for now. Well, thank you very much indeed for an extremely stimulating and wide-ranging talk that looks at some of the many implications of food and um, how it's perceived what we use it for. Um, when you've been uh, researching around Asia which has been the most complex cuisine that you've encountered, would you say? Or are they all complex? I mean, if you want to talk about a really complex cuisine in Asia, I would probably talk about Thai, which I'm not expert in, because I think when you, when you look at the, like high-end Thai cookbooks, that cooking is really extraordinary. It's like every recipe is imperial. I think what's complex about cuisines is what they mean to people and how they've changed over time um, and what do we do with them now and what do they mean? Well, um, I suspect that there are people in the audience wanting to ask questions or perhaps comment or offer their own insights. So let me throw the floor open to discussion. Uh, 
thank you for your sharing. Like, um, I really like your idea talks about uh, like how food like transformed by the culture. And then the other thing is like, um, at least like uh, you, you don't think the Macanese food is a fusion food. Yeah, like from my perspective. Um, the, the thing is like, um, do you do you think like um, if like we still get the same culture technically, but eventually um, food will develop like differently even under the same culture, but by the time. I, I, I get the question. Thank you for that. And I also see someone in the audience who I think might want to comment on this because I don't want to be the only one talking about Macanese food. But what I really see, um, I was living in Hong Kong for 20 something years and, and coming over to Macau every week teaching at IFT. And then I left for 10 years and I've just come back, well, six months ago. Um, and I, what I'm really seeing is um, another wave happening. Um, one restaurant which I might have thought once sort of was a Portuguese restaurant now seems to me to be a very um, local interpretation of Portuguese food. And, and, and meanwhile, in restaurants which I didn't really think were Macanese, modern, different kinds of interpretations of Macanese food. Now, on one, thank you, on one level, this is kind of really interesting because it is about the create, the cuisine is a, is a creative industry. So there's kind of nothing wrong with that, but I think it's really confusing, especially for tourists. And, and a problem is that we, we now have um, curated by, well, UTM now, not IFT, a bank of 30 Macanese restaurants, like these are, this is the core of Macanese food and these are the recipes. Uh, and maybe someone wants to comment on this, but I find this really problematic because Macanese food was born in the kitchen, it evolved, you know, it depended who was cooking it, you know, it, it changes depending what's available, what's fashionable, what's not, what's healthy, what's not. And now it's like being stuck in this as like a kind of museum piece in this 30 recipes. And on that one hand, we really want to preserve it. But I, it's like, who got to say what those 30 recipes were? Who, whose are they and what are they? Who got to say what those are? So I think there's two things going on here. Well, at least two. Does that sort of address your question? Does anyone else want to add anything to this? I'm looking at someone, but you don't have to. It's all right. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, oh, oh. me? <laughs> well, I have a... Hello, good evening. Hello. Hello. Thank you for coming, huh? Thank you. Congratulations. Uh, I have a lot to say about this. Yes, of course. Can you introduce yourself? I'm Marina Sina Fernandes. I'm, uh, I dedicate myself... Uh, I've dedicated to, to Macanese cuisine for, let's say, 30 years, and yeah. And, and can I just say, by the way, that even I take a book like this was published in 2003, you were so instrumental in helping me with that, oh, and as you. was your father, and there's pictures of you and your father in this book, correct? Yes. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, I would say that, um, just like you said, there are 30 pieces, 30 recipes that nobody is. Um, this is a long, it can be a long story, but I, <laughs> I, I will make it short. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, um, let's say the, the government has given, um, has kept this, 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 do you mean those 30, the, um, let me let me make it in another another way. Sure. Um, I think those those the the, the Macanese, uh cuisine should not be at this moment to develop any new fusion food because none of the peop none of us know exactly. Although I researched for a long, long time, but 
um, before we start to move on to a new level, we should know all, we should develop, we should uh, promote, we should work on those recipes that we, are, that we have. We have plenty of them. Sure. And, and the fact is, the main problem is we, those who really want to, who really want to, to work on these recipes have no um, support, yeah. for instance. Those who want to keep this, this cuisine has no support, just like Donai the restaurant. Yes, that, that, right. Uh, and sure. many, many others. However, um, uh, many, let's say, I, I, I read the, your interview today in the newspaper. Okay. And in you said something very, very true, is that there are plenty of, there are restaurants in Macau, uh, and in that menu have the Macanese food. However, they are not accurate, not at all. Uh, and, and there's no supervision. No, no, uh, IFT, I'm sorry if anyone is from IFT. Uh, um, where are they? How, where are they to teach? They have a, they play a really important role in preserving our gastronomy. Where are they? Where, uh, where is the tourism department who give the, they, any restaurant who has in their menu uh, the Portuguese or the Macanese food in their menu, this restaurant or the, the restaurant has a special rate for in the, in paying their taxes. Where are, where are they? So I think that when we want to preserve our gastronomy, it's not only us, a common citizen, uh, or those who are aficionado in, in the Macanese cuisine, but we have, we have to work all together. Uh, the government, the institutes, and, and, and give the supports, and it's only way, to, it is the only way to make this, uh, to bring this 30 uh, recipes out of the, the, um, the box and have it all in the restaurant. That's thank what I have no. a lot to say. I, I talk too much. <laughs> no, but I re really, really thank you for that input. Sorry, you were put on the, yeah, I, I put you on the stage very suddenly, but thank you, thank you so much for this. You're yeah. welcome, most welcome. <laughs> As a very talented Macanese cook, thank you. So I guess really as a sort of a little bit sum up, what we're talking about is um, Macanese food is apparently kind of the, the poster child of MGTO um, initiatives to, for Macau to become a non-gambling destination and a, and a culinary gastronomy one. Um, but it's re research, academic research from universities has shown that MGTO goes around China and does these Macanese roadshows but when people actually get to Macau or leave Macau, they still have no clue what is Macanese food. So there's this really, really beautiful intention, but it's not being delivered properly, and there's not the money to support it. I mean, name, name a local Macanese restaurant that is really purely Macanese, and I can think of two that have closed down in the last six months. With no, and no support to try and help, help them maintain, right? The reverse. Yes. What do you think of the proliferation of all sorts of different um, cuisines in the, in the casinos in particular, where it seems that you can probably at almost any hour of the day or night um, get Thai, Chinese, 
supposedly British, um, and so on and so forth, uh, Korean, Japanese, you name uh, numerous varieties of Chinese, at least if what I see on the Kotai Ferry um, is true, then um, Macau is opening itself to um, trying to become a home also to restaurants uh, from around Asia and indeed from around the world. How, how does that fit into the broader picture, do you think? I mean, I mean one, if, if Macau is to become um, a, a serious destination, not just for gambling, then of course you need beautiful five-star hotels and you need great dining. And I believe that in order to maintain um, UNESCO Creative City of Gastronomy, you have to, we have to be very, very, Macau has to be very, very active in, in terms of um, provision, festivals, food promotions. So actually, I think, it's, I think it's a really, really good sweep. And already we've got two very high-end Portuguese restaurants, and I'm very sure one of them will get a Michelin, at least one of them will get a Michelin star next year. So I think in a way it's in the right direction. So I don't really have a problem with that. But what we what we have we're talking a little bit about Macanese restaurants closing down, although they were not necessarily they were for different reasons than um, um, that the, they didn't close because they had to close. I think one closed because they were shut down because of some land use. One shut down because maybe the kids didn't want to carry on with it. The problem with all of those beautiful um, hotel restaurants is that, of course, they've got economies of scale. You can go into Wynn and get, well, a beautiful bowl of noodles, very high quality, for $88. You can barely get that on the street. And if it is $88 in an independent restaurant, it won't be of the same quality. So this, for me, is the really, really big disconnect. So what's happening to the local restaurant scene? And again, this, this needs some kind of government in, interjection. So that, for me, is the problem. We, we, we need both, I think. Do other participants have um, perhaps insights that they would like to share or comments or questions? Well, um, perhaps we should draw um, the formal part of the evening to an end um, and thank Annabelle very much indeed for uh, sharing these insights of uh, many decades of dedication to food, particularly Asian food. Uh, not just to cooking it, but also to learning more about it um, and then uh, writing, making that knowledge available to other people, as you have done tonight, but also in numerous books of which these are only two. Um, and I suppose I should also welcome you back uh, to Macau's culinary scene after 10 years' absence in Hong Kong. Um, so thank you very much indeed. I will hope to see some of you again um, at the end of the summer when we will start this lecture series up again, uh, providing that I can uh, Shanghai some speakers into coming along as I have up to date. Um, thank you very much for coming and particularly oh, thank you to our uh, partners, sponsors at the Fundacia Kunha, Rui Kunha for hosting these events. Um, you're a little, it's a little easier to get here than to go right up uh, to the very far north of Macau to the USJ
campus, though it's a very nice campus, do come there when you have a chance. But most of all, I want to thank our speaker tonight for taking this on um, and for doing such a great and interesting job of demonstrating some of the ramifications that go with the food that we all of us have to eat every day and uh, making us think a bit more about where that food came from and what it means, what we do with it. So thank you very much, Annabelle. Thank you. Okay.